Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen of Baha'i Blogcast, it's me, Rain Wilson. Before we get started with this week's episode, I just want to say that such an exciting time coming up in this one-year plan, the centenary of the passing of Abdul Baha 100 years ago. And what we're going to be doing on Baha'i Blogcast uh, for the next several months, next four, five, six months, is a great focus on Abdul Baha, the stories of Abdul Baha, the example of Abdul Baha, the impact of the teaching, the service work of Abdul Baha, the inspiration of Abdul Baha. It's a powerful time and an exciting time. And to kick off this series of conversations, I'm completely and totally thrilled to have with me one of my dearest Baha'i brother friends, Shaheen Sobhani, who is dialing in from Toronto, Canada. But don't hold that against him. He's good old-fashioned American. He's American from North uh, North Carolina. Is that right, Shaheen? North no, Carolina? from Maryland, Maryland. Close enough. Ah, close enough. <laughs> One of those Eastern Seaboard, <laughs> Atlantic Coast Conference, basketball states. And he is the founder, among other things, of 239days.com, an incredible initiative that came out around 2012. We're going to get into that. Also, his really interesting company that has been doing some Really cool, cutting-edge work, Swiss VBS. It's kind of a animation and education company. It's it's a little hard to put your finger on exactly, but it's super cool. I've had the great privilege of being able to work with them as well. Shaheen, welcome to Baha'i Blogcast. Thank you so much, Rain. A pleasure and honor to be here, my friend. Thank you. Um, you should be honored to be here. <laughs> is this is this the first podcast you've ever done? No, I've done other podcasts, but none none like Rain Wilson, let's be honest. Okay, all right, okay. I was just I was just making sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 get real. And I will say this about Shaheen too. Like he's a very competitive guy. We went he we hung out in LA and he's like, "Let's play tennis, man. Let's play tennis." And we played tennis and I kicked his butt and then he's been working on his <laughs> tennis game nonstop ever since it's been like four years. And I really think he's just, the only reason he is taking it on is he's just salivating to uh, to to play me again. Isn't that right? It's amazing, uh, Rain, how you forgot you came to Canada and we played at the Rogers Cup Stadium and uh, I actually beat you in one game. You did yeah, beat okay, me. Okay. You beat me. Let's, let's I put left that, that out. on record. Let's put how that funny, on record. I left that out. I left I left that out. That's so funny. I completely <laughs> obliterated that from my memory. Of course, I hadn't played in six months and you were playing weekly, but nonetheless, no, my, my good friend Shaheen, it's so great to get to interview you. You have such amazing stories. You're uh, one of my favorite and most gifted Baha'i storytellers, and I'm really excited for people to hear what you have to say. But let's go way, way back. Um, I love asking my Persian friends, like, What's the roots? What's their deepest Baha'i roots? What is the Sobhani clan of Iran? Take me way back to some family history there. Thanks, Rain, for that question. Uh, Before I begin, I'd like to first recognize and thank my parents, Sabet Sobhani and Nahid Berji Sobhani, who have both passed on, for giving me the greatest gift, which is the Baha'i faith to teach me about the roots of the family and the importance of service. Hmm. My father uh, and his ancestry Mm -hmm. came from Sangasak. So that's where I'm from, Sangasak. And uh, for some people that don't know Sangasak, Sangasak translated into English is stone head. Hmm. Uh, These people were incredibly stubborn, uh they were tough and most importantly they were warriors Mm. and the story goes that there was a gentleman from sangasak who had a vision or a dream about 10 years before the bob declared his mission the vision was so vivid that he woke up his family his four sons and his wife and he wanted to make sure they understood 
how important this vision was, which was he believed that the Chayim would return. And he said, when he does, we have to be ready to go to battle for him. Even if I'm not here, he told his sons they should be ready. Wow. Sure enough, he passed away in 1840. And uh, after 1844, when the Bob declared his mission, and as we know, the upheavals began with with uh, against the Babis, mm-hmm. um, Mullah Hossein came through Sangasak. And these four brothers heard about the mission of the Bab and immediately recognized them mm. and went to Fort Tabarsi with Mullah Hussein. In fact, one of the largest contingencies from every, any province or town uh, was Sangasar. 33 people from uh, Sangasar went to Fort Tabarsi. Wow. Of the four sons, one stayed behind to take care uh, of his mother. And it's interesting, even though he didn't go, in the historic books, he's considered as one of the individuals at Tabarsi. And in fact, he played a very important role. He brought he brought uh, supplies to the people uh, at the fort. Of the three brothers left, one uh, was martyred on the same night as Mullah Hussein. Another, uh, after the fort uh, was given up, some individuals said, we'll take him back, but they were enemies of him. And that brother was literally torn to pieces and never made it back to Sangasar. And then the fourth brother did make it back to Sangasar. Um, through my family, we're related to two of these four uh, brothers. And it's interesting. The last one that returned was one of the individuals that Nabil uh, spoke to, to find out about the stories and what happened at Fort Tavarsi. And two of those brothers are, their pictures are in the Dawnbreakers and mentioned there for their acts of heroism. Wow. So when you ask me about the roots, um, I'm humbled. And it's an incredible responsibility to carry on this tradition uh, of these individuals. Mm. You know what? I have very, very little memory of Iran. But I remember my first day in first grade. How how old were you when you left? I, when we came to the States, I was six and a half, seven, mm-hmm. but I went to first grade in Iran. I was five. And by the time we left, it was six. And that first grade, in, the first day of school in Iran was an interesting one because I was sitting there just like everybody else. And then the teacher, because there was Quranic class, it was part of the class, no problem, had told everyone, please get up and say the following. Our prophet Muhammad says... And, uh, you know, Shaheen says, your prophet Muhammad says, <laughs> and, and the teacher said, well, well and, you know, I, I obviously got a deep voice even back then. <laughs> you know, I had a mustache when I was eight. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the teacher said, oh, hang on, everyone sit down. Shaheen, repeat after me. Our prophet Muhammad said, and I said, your prophet Muhammad says, he says, why do you keep saying that? I said, it is your prophet. My prophet is Baha'u'llah. And she went, oh, you're a Baha'i. I said, yes. She goes, okay, stay standing. All the Baha'i kids, please stand up. And it was two little girls and myself. And she said to the entire class, don't forget, first day, first grade. She said to the entire class, do not play with these kids. They are najest. Najest means dirty. Do not play with them. Uh, they will defile you, basically. I was devastated, Rain. Totally devastated. And I, you know, the two little girls started crying like, what the heck just happened? And I myself didn't know what to do. And this little kid in front of me said, don't worry, buddy. I'll play with you. He was my neighbor. And I, I, I was so angry. And my father and mother obviously uh, found this out and they realized we got to get the hell Shaheen. We got to get him out of here. He's going to kill people (laughs) with this Sangasari blood. So that's why we left Iran. We left Iran in 1973. So I want to make it clear. Mm. This wasn't after the revolution. This was 1972 uh, when this happened. So this was my first 
interaction um, with with prejudice and my faith, you know, head on. Wow, that is that's a that's a brutal story. And do you do you remember any of the treatment you received at the hands of the kids after that, or you were gone pretty quickly thereafter? It was we we left fairly quickly after that, and uh, except for that little boy who decided to play with me, which I remember, I don't remember his name. Uh, uh, I just it, it was just you know who remembers their first day of first grade? I sure as heck do. But I have to tell you, Rain, mm-hmm. first day of school in the United States of America was also very interesting because I was impacted mm. with something else that I wasn't aware of. Um, and I, we were in Barberton, Ohio, uh, very close to Akron. So my, my mother had to, uh, being a medical doctor in the, in Tehran, she had to go through residency again, and she went through pediatric residency. So we ended up in Ohio and we were there. And all I remember is my father, who I adored said to me, listen, son, this is not Iran. Do not worry. No one's going to attack you here because of your faith. This is the United States of America. You're going to be just fine. And I said, okay. And then he told me something very funny. He said, Shaheen, whatever the teacher says to you, you do here. Because he knew what I had gone through in Iran. But here he was convinced (laughs) that whatever the teacher says, make sure you do. Now, you have to realize I only knew hello and goodbye, literally Hello and goodbye. And but I love my father so much. I said, "Yes, sir. Whatever he says, I'll do." And Rain, we went. I went into class, and I came from this really strict school in Iran. Here, the kids were throwing spitballs, airplanes. One kid was on top of the table yelling. I don't know what he was yelling. And I said, <laughs> "I'm gonna love this country. This is great." absolutely great but my dad said be a good boy and rain i went and i sat down i said i'll just wait and then mr williams walked in now mr williams was a six foot four black man now i hadn't seen many uh african americans in in iran but that i didn't care about that that's not what was the issue the issue was his height. He was six foot four. He was, I, I'd never seen such a tall human being from little Iranians that I was used to. And I was just like, wow, this is a mountain of a human being. But here's the best part, Rain. He came in and he went, shosh, 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 shosh. Now, don't forget, my dad said, whatever your teacher says you do. Now, what you need to know is that shush in Persian means urinate. Oh, no. <laughs> to urinate. No. And I went, oh, my God. People just urinate all over the floor here? I was already thinking they're wild, but this has gone beyond my imagination. You really Sorry, did. You I brought this down to like an animal again. house level here. <laughs> this is fantastic. What happened? <laughs> So what happened is I looked at him and I looked at the other students and Rain, I will tell you like I remember it yesterday. If someone would have got up, I would have got up too and I would have done it. I oh, have. good. It didn't happen. But thank okay. God no one had to go. <laughs> so no one got up. But you should know this happened three or four times that day. And I kept looking at everyone very nervously, going, are they going to go or not? But no one had to go until, of course, I realized what shush meant. But here's the interesting part of the story. Mr. Williams clearly realized I didn't know any English. And you know, Rain, on his own time and on his own dime, he spent almost three months with me after school for wow. about two hours a day Wow! teaching me English. I am who I am. You know, I, I should have failed that grade, Rain. Without question, I did not fail. I passed, right? And I want you to remember, first grade is in Iran, first day of school in Iran, and this was my first day. And here is Mr. Williams. But what really also got me angry. I fell in love with Mr. Williams. 
because of what he did for me. And I didn't understand why the other students and even some of the adults and other teachers treated Mr. Williams the way they treated because he was a black man. And I wanted to yell at them going, are you guys out of your mind? Do you know who Mr. Williams is and what he's done? And that's the first time that I had to confront racism right here in the United States at the age of seven. And I've been passionate to make sure um, we deal with this issue. And we're gonna talk about it when, I, when the visit of Abdul Baha on this most challenging issue. Wow, what a beautiful story. Thank you so much. And just catch us up a little bit, like what happened? You high school, college, what did you degree in and what kind of what kind of work did you did you land into? Well, you know, being in a Persian culture, my mom was a doctor, uh, my uncle was a doctor, my auntie was a doctor. They came from a line of doctor families because they came from a family called the Bergis family. And the reason was in 1952, their uncle, my mom's uncle, was stabbed to death for being a Baha'i. And since then, uh, many, many Berejesus became doctors. So, of course, that was in my mind. I have to become doctor. And uh, I got my degree in chemistry. And as I was pursuing it, I was getting a master's degree in biochemistry. My dad realized, yeah, Shaheen's not going to go for that. <laughs> and uh, he got me into business, my, my father. Uh, and once I got a taste of business and, and what it was like, I just uh, fell in love with it and took a, took a right turn and got my master's degree in business administration and started several companies until the one you mentioned, Swiss VBS, a digital learning agency, which uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, sell actually last year. And I still work for that company now. So this is a great place for me to insert my Baha'i doctor joke. Okay. So. There is um, a Persian Baha'i woman and her son, and he gets he wins the election for president of the United States of America, and he calls his mom like, "Come to the White House, you know, for the inauguration." She's like, "Oh no no no, I can't come." And um, he's like, "I'll fly you on Air Force One." She's like, "Oh no 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 no, I can't come." He's like, "I'll fly you on Air Force One. There'll be tons of." Kebab, gorma sabze, um, you know, fess in June, whatever you want. She's like, okay, okay, I'll come to Washington, D.C. She comes to Washington, D.C. The first Persian Baha'i is sworn in as president of the United States. And um, uh, he's being sworn in, his hands on the Bible. And she's sitting down next to the Secretary of State. And she she nudges him as he's being sworn in. All this, the Air Force, you know, is flying over squadrons in a 21 gun salute and hundreds of thousands of people. She nudges the, the secretary of state next to her. And she says, my other son is a doctor. <laughs> so, you know what we had to deal with. <laughs> Real quick. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, uh, with the Land Egg Academy? A lot of people don't know uh, about this chapter, but there was a short-lived Baha'i University in Switzerland. Isn't that what originally brought you to Switzerland? That's exactly correct. I got to Switzerland. It was two, uh, 1994. Um, and, you know, the other thing I should tell you is I, I've been very fortunate in, in my life. Um, my father passed away at the age of 55. And um, he, he, I was 23 when he passed away. And, and he, he was more than my father. He, he had become my best friend. And so I lost my best friend and my father that day. And But, you know, total believer that he's going to take care of me. And he did. And he gave me three mentors who are all gone now. The most recent one being Douglas Martin. Uh, but he first gave me Professor Boshri, who, who met the beloved guardian and taught me so much. And then Dr. Hossein Danish, who I worked with uh, at Landig all those years. And then uh, Douglas Martin, um, who just yes. taught me an incredible amount. And hopefully we get a chance to talk about Douglas. But I, I, I went there in 1995 and uh, I was there till about uh, 2002 until I started my own business. Landig was before its time. 
you know, I, I want to say, say that, but it was one of the greatest experiences I've had in my life. You know, the, the, the world came to us and we got a chance to really experiment with what a Baha'i university could potentially be. And I'm hoping future Baha'i universities will uh, learn from it, both the mistakes and the successes uh, that we had. Um, but what what was it? Like, dig into it. Roll up your sleeves. Like, wh- how many students were there? What were the kind of teachers? What were the degrees? Yeah. Um, how was it funded? Yeah. So it started It started as a summer school, really. Um, that's how it started. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when we got there, the idea was, okay, let's get it beyond summer school. It was also being rented out to just different groups from different backgrounds to use it literally as a conference center. Uh, which which needed it because of the finances. By the way, Switzerland isn't the cheapest place to be. So it was a good idea that they did that. But to take the next step, we started a master's program uh, in leadership, um, in business, uh, in consultation. So just various programs that we started. And, and it, it went very well. That part went very well. And then we started uh, the bachelor's program. To, to give it a go because we needed to keep the place going year round, not just in the summers and when people had time off. And I have to say that part was uh, a bit, uh, it, that was a struggle. And the reason for the struggle was to, 9-11 happened. <laughs> when 9-11 happened, it really uh, caused a, a downturn in landing, uh, you know, for the place to be closed for almost six to eight months uh, before we got students to come. It really never, ever recovered Mm. from that. And slowly but surely, unfortunately, it it wasn't sustainable. And then eventually it closed. But there were different programs that went to different places. Well, one of the most successful programs was called Education for Peace, uh, which moved to the Mm. Czech Republic. And uh, what I've understood is still going on. Uh, But the the university-style programs did not. Um, but there's a nice community of Landegites out there that are doing great things. And it was a, it was a wonderful who's who of educators and professors, no? Definitely. Absolutely. Nader Saidi, Rhett Diesner. I mean, some of the greatest high professors we know, they came and they spent their time and uh, really helped out. Landeg also helped with the uh, BIHE uh, in, in connecting uh, universities with them and trying to help uh, as well. And this, they started a program called Education for Peace in Bosnia, Herzegovina, which became a, a very interesting project in training uh, trainers on peace education in a, in a war-ridden place uh, like Bosnia was. Fantastic. And tell us, um, skip forward a little bit, a mentor of yours, a friend of yours, you know, a lifelong kind of learning partner of yours uh, was former House member Douglas Martin. Can you tell us a little bit about that relationship, how it started and where it went? Yeah, I was visiting. uh, The great thing about being in Switzerland, I could go visit Haifa for three day visits all the time. And uh, Douglas had come uh, to Landig when he was a member of the House and, and, and gave some talks uh, for, for different events. We had this forum at the end of the year, and it was, it was very nice uh, that, that he did that. So I got to at least know him uh, there. So when I went to Haifa and he knew I was there, um, he honored me. We, we had a lunch, and he said, Shaheen, let's have some lunch. So I said, sure. And uh, I, I got there, and then he said to me, he was telling me about his trip uh, after 9-11. He was stuck in the Atlanta airport for I don't know how many hours. He couldn't get out because of 9-11, probably days. And I made a very innocent comment back then. Um, unfortunately, his wife had passed away, so he was all alone. And, and I said, you know, Miss Martin, if you ever take those trips, and, and it seems like it was horrible for you, uh, call on me. I'll, I'll go with you. And Douglas was a person that you couldn't joke around with. He grabbed my arm, Rain, immediately after that comment and said, listen, I know Persians tar off, but do not tar off about things like this. <laughs> can you, said, can no, you explain no, tar off to those yeah. seven listeners oh, that don't sorry, know what it is? Sorry, tar off. T- yeah, 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 thank you, Rain. Tar off means you say something, but you really don't mean it. 
and someone tries to like, you know, say, no, 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 no. And you got to say it a couple of times before someone says, okay, okay. On an, on an earlier episode, and, uh, Dr. Manaz Javid, the founder of the Mona Foundation, talked about when she first came to yeah. mid-America, um, barely spoke any English at all. And the, the family would be like, oh, would you like some dinner? And she'd be like, oh, no, 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 please don't put yourself out. I'm not hungry, really. And they'd be like, oh, okay, good night. And she didn't eat for weeks because <laughs> she, she would tear off. <laughs> she realized you can't. <laughs> you got to say how it is. So that's what he was worried about, that that's what I was doing. But anyway, we took our first trip. He called on me. I have to say, he when he called me finally, I had just started the business mm -hmm. reign. It was like three weeks in and people have businesses. They know three weeks in, you don't go anywhere. I said, forget it. I took three weeks off <laughs> and traveled the world with Douglas. We took four, um, we took over 20 trips. We visited 14 countries and 42 cities over the 10 years I was with Douglas. It was unbelievable, unbelievable experience. Was he on the house at this point or was it after his service on the house? Uh, one trip he was on the house. Mm -hmm. That was 2005. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so only one time he was a member of the house when I traveled with him and then he retired. And then after he retired is when all the, all the, all the trips really began and all these incredible cities and incredible people, uh, that we met. And, you know, he, he, ha he had a master of the English language. And if, if you haven't read when, when he passed away, the, the house of justice said he had this, um, the word they used scintillating intellect. And they used resolute, ingenious, and blessed with piercing insight. These are the wow. words that the House of Justice used about Douglas. And uh, he had it. I experienced it, right? And just simple things, Rain. Uh, because I had the business in Toronto, so I would stay with him. I would come on Sunday and leave on Thursday. So I he just said, stay with me. And God, I loved it. We, I, I did that for several months. I'd stay with him. In fact... Uh, by the fourth month, I was like, Douglas, I'm here every week. I, I, I think I got to get a place. And he looked at me and he goes, what? My extra bedroom isn't good enough for you? What's the problem? I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> I realize you can't tar up with Douglas. But Well, he was he started as a historian and a sociologist, no? Yeah, Which is it, my, my favorite. If I could redo everything and, and not go into the arts, I would do uh, history and sociology. I just love those topics so much. Yeah. So it gave him, um, I know in the, little, in the few talks that I've seen, the very, very few that exist online, he kind of puts... Uh, the Baha'i faith into an incredible historical perspective that I've really never heard yeah. uh, other than The Guardian. Yeah, you got it. And that's why uh, the, even the House of Justice used the grasp of grand forces of history is another term they used in that uh, obituary type letter that they sent. Um, but simple things even rain. It, just the mastery of the English language. Once I, I was late to dinner with him uh, from work when I was in Toronto, and I called him and I said, Douglas, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be about five minutes late. And he goes, well, I'm trembling with excitement. You know, <laughs> I was like, most people say, okay, <laughs> see you in five minutes. Not Douglas. I was like, wow. And history, I'm glad you said it. So a lot of places we would go, our fa my favorite thing, and he loved it too. I would force him to sit on a park bench and he'd give me a history lesson. The one, my favorite one was at the Lincoln Memorial. We went to the Lincoln Memorial and I was in bodyguard mode, making sure everything was fine. And he was reading the Gettysburg Address, Rain. And I looked over and he had a little tear coming down his mm. eye, reading the Gettysburg mm. Address. I went, okay, I gotta, I gotta learn about this. I got a park bench and he told me about Lincoln and who he was. And when you read that Gettysburg Address, you know that that was inspired by Baha'u'llah's revelation. And, and I did, I went and reread that and he was absolutely correct. So he just, just his insight on history and how it connected with everything else. My favorite story, Rain, uh, with Douglas is how he became a Baha'i. It's, it's, it's a very powerful story because it has so much mixed in it, including the power of prayer. Um, so <laughs> it was 1953 and he had heard about the faith uh, through a friend. And he started going to these things called firesides. 
Uh, by the way, Firesides was started by May Maxwell in Montreal at her home. So this concept of Firesides is very interesting. Started here in Canada. So they, he, he would go uh, to these Firesides at who? Uh, John and Audrey Robarts, who became, Mr. Robarts became a mm. hand of the cause. So he was going to their Firesides and he said, you know, Shaheen, it was interesting. As I was going, I was so intrigued by these principles and these people and thought, my God, there's a religion that talks about stuff like this. This is incredible. And then he noticed some of the people that were going to the firesides started saying, hey, we want to be part of this. We want to be Baha'is. And he said, I'll never forget. Um, I, I was going to the Robarts and then I went and sat on a bench in a park and he showed me that bench and he showed me that park. And he said, I sat on that bench, Shaheen, and I said to myself, you can't continue to do this. You're lying to yourself. You hate religion. You can't be part of religion. And no matter how nice these people are, they expect you or they feel like you're going to join and roll up your sleeves and start working. You're not going to do that. And he said, you know, that was my brain talking. And my brain said, when you leave this park, you will never go back and you're going to leave this behind. And he was convinced that that's what he was going to do. And he was about to take the last step out of the park. And he said, Shaheen, I got a rush from the bottom of my heart, came to my brain and said, you're so stupid. It was like someone was yelling at me. Why are you so stupid? Who cares if you don't believe in religion? This is the greatest thing you've ever heard. And you know that you have to be part of this. Don't be a fool. And he said, it was so powerful. That's where my faith was born at that moment. I didn't even question it. I went, I rang the bell, I opened the door. John Robarts opened the door and Audrey right behind him. And he said to them, I want to be a Baha'i. Oh. And they were a little startled. And they were like, sure, come on in, hugs and kisses. And he says, I'll never forget, Mr. Robarts turned to me and he said, you know, this is interesting, uh, Douglas. It's April 21st, 1953. You learn this in the future, but there's this thing called the 10-year crusade. And I believe you're the first Baha'i of the 10-year crusade in Canada. And uh, that was it. But Rain, that's not the okay. story. Okay, okay, there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. That is far from the story. The story is now four or five years down the road. He's pioneering living in a village um, near Niagara called St. Catherine. Not a village now anymore. It's a city that, close to Niagara Falls. And St. Catherine, as they were home front pioneers, they were responsible for Niagara Falls on the Canadian side to meet people and to start a new community there. They had their own community in St. Catherine. And things weren't going well, Rain. Not well at all. So he said, let's invite Mr. Robarts to inspire us of what we need to hmm. do. Well, Mr. Robarts showed up, and uh, I believe he was a hand of the cause by this time. And Mr. Robarts said, okay, what are you guys doing? And they had said, and so forth. And Mr. Robarts got up, and he said, well, the problem is you guys aren't praying enough. He said, praying enough? What, what does that mean? Uh, we are praying. He said, no, then you're not praying systematically. I thought, well, we are praying systematically, Mr. Roberts. He goes, no, you're not. And, and they all looked confused. And he said, this is what you got to do. Every one of you, do you know someone in Niagara Falls? And they said, everyone said, yes. He said, well, okay, I want you to think of that person. You pray for them morning and evening. And your only objective is that Somehow you find a way to talk to them about the faith and you keep doing that for 30 days. And everyone's like, then what? I said, well, if on the 31st day, nothing happens, you drop them and you find another person and start praying for that person. And you continue to do that. Is, is there any, is any specific prayer? Nope. You just said prayer at that just, point. Okay. You just said uh -huh. prayer. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, Clearly, everyone's like, what is he talking about? And he saw that. And he goes, I don't understand why you have a problem with this. Look, we did it for Douglas, and he's sitting here. And the talk ended. <laughs> now, 
Douglas had no idea what Mr. Robarts was talking about. He went to Mr. Robarts and said, Mr. Robarts, what do you mean you did it for me? He goes, yes, Douglas, Audrey and I prayed for you for 30 days. And remember when you rang the bell? He said, yes. He goes, we loved you so much. We sat and decided this is the 30th day <laughs> for Douglas. So we prayed and said the tablet of Ahmad. Mm. And you rang the bell because mm. the next day we were moving on to the next person, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's amazing. So Douglas is convinced that when his brain, his brain was trying to get him out of the faith, yeah. these two individuals were praying him into the faith. And of course, the rest is history. He became a member of the National Spiritual Assembly. He was there for the first election of the Universal House of Justice, became a uh, Office of Public Information director, and then, of course, a uh, member of the House of Justice, like I said. So, power of prayer, Rain. Wow, Total that is, that's an extraordinary, extraordinary story. Um, and uh, gets me thinking about my own teaching work and how, how little I use prayer as a real tool you know, in that work. So that's so inspiring to hear. Um, before we get to 239 days and, and Abdul Baha, the point of all this, tell us a little bit more about Swiss VBS. What, what's the kind of work you do? And, and you've been able to use some of that work uh, in service to the cause as well. Yes. So, you know, Swiss VBS, what we are is a digital learning agency. And what that means is customers, uh, companies, Fortune 100 companies come and they they give us their content. Uh, it could be about a product, about a service that they offer. And we digitize that content and, and put it online. And now we're putting it on uh, tablets and mobile phones so people can learn uh, on the road. And one of the things we do is we work on the sustainment of those tools. So we have applications and platforms to help people uh, literally learn in what we call micro learning and bite sized content. So hopefully it'll be retained. Uh, the human brain is bombarded with information today. How do you create content that's engaging, that it stays in that brain and is retained? So that's what we did. And, you know, from from very early on, I decided I, I got to use these talent, especially, you know, we read a message from the Universal House of Justice in creating a coherent life you know, we, we have to find ways to serve wherever we can through our professions. So I was fortunate enough to, to do that. Uh, and one of the first projects, actually, Douglas helped us, is called One Common Faith. Uh, it's uh, onecommonfaith.net. We took the document in 2005 called One Common Faith. It was a document that the Universal House of Justice wrote in a call to their own question from 2002, seven months after 9-11. Uh, the House of Justice wrote to the religious leaders of the world and basically said, as religious leaders, it is our duty to start talking about the oneness of religion. And the response, I have no idea, but uh, I guess it wasn't the greatest response from other religious leaders. So in 2005, uh, the House of Justice decided to answer its own call and really explain what does a oneness mm. of religion mean. So it's a, it's a premier document for us as Baha'is uh, and anyone else for that matter. When we talk about the, the oneness of religion, what does it really mean? You need to read and study that document. So that was one project we did. Uh, another one I was fortunate more as a, just a supporter was Baha'iebooks.org. So we put the major Baha'i works um, online and and I, I was happy to be able to support that. Um, it's free for all, uh, for anyone to download these great books. And then uh, this project, 239days.com, which we're about to talk. And then, of course, uh, other projects like the one we did with you, An Introduction to the Baha'i Faith, uh, which was a 14-minute animated uh, fireside. And uh, very happy about those. Wonderful. So 239 Days was launched in 2012, the centenary of Abdul Baha's trip, which was 239 days long, through America, North America. And it's a day-by-day -day diary of where Abdul Baha went 
and what he said. And uh, tell us about the origins of that and about the the reboot uh, of it, because it, it looks amazing. You guys have like, it's 239 Days 2.0. Uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. No, you know, in 2012, if if you remember, there was a lot of excitement and energy to commemorate this incredible journey that Abdul Baha took. You know, we forget he was 69 years old. He had been a prisoner for over 50 years. Wow. Right? Mm. You know, um, and he took this incredible, incredible journey to the West and 239 days here. Uh, in North America. So the idea originated, at first, I, I, I was going down a road of, let's create a documentary film of this trip. Then a couple guys got together, people I knew, uh, and said, no, what do you think of this, Shaheen, of creating a social media documentary? And I thought, this is, I was all in. I loved the idea, because then we were following Abdul Baha every day, but it's, it would require incredible research to see uh, who did Abdul Baha see, what did he say, um, wh- who were the people that met him at one point, what point in time. So we hired a team of people. We were about three or four people full time working on the research of this project to really get every day down. And I'm hoping future historians, they owe us one, man. <laughs> because we've now documented it for him. And of course, it's going to be added and it's going to be richer. And of course, it's just an attempt of this incredible trip. Because the one thing we keep forgetting, you know, Baha'u'llah called Abdul Baha the mystery of God. Mm. <laughs> I, I really don't need to say more when you hear something like that. Shovi Effendi um, has said it's, you know, it's difficult for us to truly understand the role of Abdul Baha in not only the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, uh, but in the entire field of religion, because he fulfills a very unique function. And you, you could read that in God Passes By of what Shoei Effendi said. And then the last thing before I begin on this and why I truly wanted to do it is because Baha'u'llah has said the following. He said, blessed Doubly blessed is the ground which his footsteps have trodden. Mm. (laughs) Mm. And, you know, I'll name these cities that he went to and whoever's listening to this when you, you know, of course, if you believe in this statement, you know, these are blessed grounds that Abdul Baha uh, stepped on. So um, kudos to the team. I want to mention two fellows who, who brought it to my attention and, and they worked hard on it and did a lot of the writing. Jonathan Menon and Rob uh, Socket, they, they were incredible. And they were part of this reboot um, as well. So what did you learn? So, you know, we've read little biographies of Abdu'l-Bahá in America and, you know, journals of famous Baha'is of the time. And you read some of his talks that he's done at churches. But this is like a fine-tooth comb of, like, what train did he take? And where did he stop over? And where did he spend the night? And who did he meet with? So you had to have unearthed some incredible gems about Abdu'l-Bahá in going through uh, day by day this uh, amazing you know, transformative for the continent of North America, transformative journey. Yeah, we did rain. And the first thing, I, you know, what did we learn? One thing I learned is abdul kept it very simple. He, he, he kept it very simple and his message was crystal clear and he only gave a little bit more, right? He talked about Christ in synagogues. He talked about Muhammad mm. in churches, <laughs> You know, he just one little step above. But there were three themes, three themes that was prevalent in many of the things we found. It was on race, Mm -hmm. peace, and women's rights. These are the three themes that I saw. There were many more, but these three were very, uh, very prevalent. Let's talk about race, because you've told me some of these stories, um, how— insightful, hard-hitting. I mean, he didn't even want to—he was invited to come to the United States earlier, but 
the Baha'is of North America, the blacks and whites weren't meeting together. So he refused to come. Isn't that part of the story? That's right. That is part of the story. And, and, and until they did it, and that was 1908 when he was first invited, right after he was released from the Young Turk Revolu uh, Revolution, he was released and he did not come. He, you know, and this was one of the one of the issues uh, that had to be resolved. And when he got here, he hit it head on. He called it the most challenging issue, as we know. But he also said, if if it's not resolved, it's going to be the potential devastation of the United States of America. Right. So, I mean, this is this. We know it's a serious matter, but. He was talking about this in 1912. And then in some places where it was a taboo, he was encouraging interracial marriage. Wow. <laughs> Nobody talked about that topic, right? We have headlines that we found in Cleveland, Ohio. It says prophet from the East um, uh, encourages interracial marriage. Interesting that Abdu'l-Bahá, because in some states it was illegal. It was illegal for interracial marriage. Mm. But he decided to make those comments in states that were legal, like Ohio. Mm. <laughs> but how did he know that? You know, there was no internet or Instagram, but he did, you know. And and if you want to really see what the issue was for him, Howard University, 1,600 students and faculty were there, black and white. And he starts his talk, today I am happy. For I see white and black sitting together. And then he gives this talk uh, about racial unity. So I think uh, we have to um, go back and read these stories and how he addressed some of them. What he did with Louis Gregory at the, uh, at the consulate in Washington. And he did it with such ease. No one questioned him uh, when he did it, right? Um, one, a couple of things, because you asked me. What are some of the interesting things you've you found, uh, uh, Rain? For example, when we were doing the research, we found the original ship manifest from the SS Cedric, April 11th, 1912. And it was the immigration officers asking Abdul Baha a bunch of questions. And it's there we find out he's five foot five, blue eyes. And when they asked him what his profession was, he said author. The other thing I thought was very interesting, and I've seen this in other resources, is that whenever he signed his name in English, he made it little a for Abdul and big B for Baha. Mm. Also interesting mm. to emphasize the Baha part, even in simple uh, as, a, as a signature. And this Wendell Phillips Dodge was the first reporter to interview him. And he, you know, he did a brilliant job, thank God. And by the way, Wendell Phillips Dodge became a Baha'i later on. No kidding. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. He became a first reporter to interview him and he became a Baha'i later on. Um, so, for example, you know, what the what the project did is it connected it to things that you and I see every day and we didn't realize. For example, when the Cedric was moving to go to port, they passed the Statue of Liberty, mm -hmm. right? They're passing the Statue of Liberty. And Abdullah turns to the reporters and say, this is the symbol of freedom for the West. And then he makes this unbelievable quote that we as Baha'is know, but we didn't know it was connected as he was passing to the Statue of Liberty. He says, after being 40 years a prisoner, I can tell you that freedom is not a matter of place. It is a condition. When one is released from the prison of self, that is indeed a release. Mm, mm. How would we have ever known mm. that until we did that research? And then the, the, the other thing I love, and I didn't know this um, at all, is what Abdu'l-Bahá did say things in English sometimes. Mm. And it was first time was on that Cedric, a New York Tribune reporter reported that Abdu'l-Bahá answered some questions in English. So that's how we know. And this was one statement from Abdu'l-Bahá in English. He, he says, I am here. And it says, uh, it says Abdu'l-Bahá said in his gentle voice, I am here to unify the religions of the world. 
And the headline was, Persian prophet here, Abdul Baha Abbas, comes to preach universal peace. New York Tribune, April 12th, 1912. Mm, <laughs> that's beautiful. And one of the stories that really touched me was, wasn't he initially brought to meet Taft or taken to the White House, but it didn't work out, but he was he was reinvited to the White House and, and even to speak to Congress, but at the same time, yeah. he had already committed to speak at the second annual NAACP convention, and he turned down the White House and Congress in order to go speak uh, to the NAACP, which was a nascent organization, obviously its second year. Absolutely. Um, that that to yeah, me yeah. shows me, you know, someone, you know, I'm sorry, putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that story is, is an incredible story. And I'm, that was one we had to unearth uh, because you can't find it in many places. So he was invited by President Taft to the White House on April 28th, 1912, to meet with the president at 12.30. And the reason I think he was invited um, is that Friday morning, he had spoken at the president's church, the All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington. Then on Saturday, which was April 27th, some members of the Taft family had, it, had attended an evening at Mrs. Parsons' house, and there were about 300 people there. So obviously this got back to Taft, and Taft was like, I, I got to meet him. And he did. So uh, he did not meet him. Sorry. Uh, the invitation went out and Abdul Baha went to the executive mansion. And then an aide came out and said, sorry, the president just arrived at 4 a.m. And he's got to take a six o'clock train. He was in the middle of an election and we have to postpone. It. And so Abdul Baha did not meet President Taft. Uh, and interesting enough, just again, to show you how close we are, he got back on his carriage with Mrs. Parsons and Dr. Ferry, and they stopped at the Ellipse, which we all know where that is in front of the White House. And he got out, Rain, and walked along the trees there uh, with Mrs. Parsons and uh, Dr. Ferry, took a nice stroll uh, in the Ellipse and came. And it's interesting. It was 11 years later in 1923 that President Coolidge started this American tradition of lighting the national Christmas tree, where at the same spot Abdullah mm. was at. <laughs> so every time you see the national Christmas tree uh, light up, you should know that Abdul Baha was, was right there. And of course, the, I read you the quote from Baha'u'llah, uh, blessed, doubly blessed uh, are the footsteps he trotted. So yeah, so then, uh, then, what happened was uh, he was invited to speak at Congress, but a week later, and uh, he said no. And the person that invited him was a William Saltzer. He was a Democratic congressman from New York, um, and he was the chairman of the um, House Foreign Affairs Committee. And, and he actually is interesting. He said after he had a private meeting with Abdul Baha, he actually said, he felt like he just talked to the prophet Elijah and Moses. He, those are the words of the of William Saltzer after he met uh, Abdul Baha. And then Champ Clark is the one uh, speaker of the house who invited Abdul Baha. And as you said, he politely declined uh, because he went to the. It, it wasn't the second reign; it was the fourth annual conference oh, okay. of the NAACP that he went to. And he left that that evening, the day he was supposed to meet Taft. At twelve thirty, at about five p.m., he was on a train mm, to Chicago. Mm, fantastic. Other takeaways uh, from the the deep dive of research you guys did into these precious two hundred and thirty nine days. You know, we, we know. You know, these. Inc we feel, and this is this is really rough, and I'm I'm sure future historians will figure it out. But we think that Abdul Baha spoke to over a hundred thousand people, right? Wow. During this trip, wow. yeah. And this is without technology and all the stuff we have that that for sure. When Dodge wrote his first article on April 11th, uh, it reached 23 uh, newspapers. Mm. <laughs> so when when people woke up the next day, um, they all heard about Abdul Baha, all the major newspapers uh, in the West. And, you know, the president of Stanford University said, 
he will surely unite the East and the West, right? A famous columnist said, let him visit any bank, factory, office building, church, and everything is laid aside and eyes bulge and ears listen until he takes his departure, right? So what we have tried to do and what we're hoping is people go back. What you'll experience is not only historical context, but you will learn what we need to do today. <laughs> the topics he talked about, race, women's rights, peace, they're as relevant, if in some cases, more relevant today. And how did he address them and, and what he did? And yeah, I'm hoping. And something you and I have talked about in the past, I, I told you uh, going back to this uh, document, One Common Faith, there's one line in One Common Faith and Douglas pointed it out to me and we studied for an hour just on this line. Uh, it says religion is religion as science is science. And you and I discussed how the two ecosystem of religion and science, you know, science being an ecosystem that has chemistry, biology and everything, and you can't take one of them out. They're one ecosystem. And religion, unfortunately, we haven't followed the same methodology, but it's also one ecosystem. And you brilliantly said, but Shaheen, there are two ecosystems of one reality. And I found this quote uh, from, uh, actually it was day two, that Abdu'l-Baha gave uh, at the Church of Ascension in Greenwich. That was the first church he spoke at. And he said, material civilization is like unto the lamp, while spiritual civilization is the light in that lamp. That's the connection, as you said to me once, Rain, that those two realities work hand in hand and they work together in that way. Shaheen, these stories are incredible. Uh, everyone, please go to 239days.com. Please promote it, put it on your Facebook, send it out to your friends. You can have study groups um, on each of the days. It's an incredible resource. And Shaheen, thanks for bringing it to light. Anything you want to leave us with? Thanks, Ray. Um, I do want to leave you with one thing. Uh, as I said, one of my mentors was Professor Sohail Bushri, who met the beloved guardian. And he said this to me privately many times and, and publicly he even mentioned it. But when he first told me privately this, I, I thought, wow, what a powerful message. And whenever I get a chance, I would love to share it. And it's the following. And he would use these exact words. He said, Shaheen, in the final analysis, when you look at your life, the only thing that's important is how you have served humanity and this beloved cause. So just remember that uh, moving forward. And I thought, my God, he's right. It doesn't matter how much e-learning courses I've sold or how many films you made, Rain, or how much product we sold and profitability and none of that. All that is totally irrelevant. It's about the service we've given to humanity. Um, and in some of the projects that I mentioned to you, and especially 239 Days, this is the underlining aspect. Uh, of of Abdul Baha's message uh, in the West, so hopefully um, all of us could learn from this really uh, pearls of wisdom that we have in front of us. Mm, that's beautiful. So well said, Shaheen Sopani. Thank you so much for being a guest, uh, my dear friend. I can't wait to meet you back on the tennis court. The the greatest <laughs> service you could do for me is to play tough, but in the end, ultimately lose. <laughs> I'll do my best, Ray. <laughs> fall at my sword. What do you what do you say? <laughs> I'll do my best, brother. I'll do my best. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night.